Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the B2B Content Show, a podcast about the how, what, and why of B2B content marketing. The B2B Content Show is brought to you by Conversa, a podcast agency that helps B2B brands connect through conversation. I'm Jeremy Shear, and my guest today is Martin Morzinski. Martin is Senior Vice President of Marketing at Streetlight, which is a cloud platform for measuring street and pedestrian traffic. So, Martin, thanks so much for uh, making time. Great to have you on the show. Thank you. Good morning. Great to be here. So let's dive right into our topic, which is namely getting customers to see your vision of what's possible. And let me have you start by describing for street light, for street right, street right, street light. What does that look like? What is the the vision of what's possible that you try to communicate to your audience? So maybe I'll start with the <clears throat> sort of the impetus for street light, which dates back a decade and a bit, um, where the founders looked at transportation, which is a massive industry that spends you know, trillions of dollars around the world and contributes a third uh, to emissions, and yet is largely managed on limited information. And uh, for those of us who you know, drive around our cities, uh, I'm sure you've driven over these sort of rubber tubes that count traffic. And they're one example of a very old way of, of measuring traffic out there. Uh, and the way it's done, it's, you know, it's spotty and, and there's not much of it. And for, you know, every thousand miles of roadway, uh, you may literally have, you know, a few handfuls of counters, which leave a lot of information about what happens on the roadways, sort of unexplored and, and invisible. And Laura Shul uh, looked at this problem back in 2011. She's the founder of Streetlight. Um, and saw a mismatch between a need for information and what was being provided and the opportunity to use essentially, uh, you know, location data from cell phones to try to understand how things move. And that evolved over time. And we added a whole host of data sources, you know, literally hundreds of data sources that include connected vehicle data and all sorts of truck fleet data and um, now <laughs> IoT data. And have used machine learning and, and, and lots of uh, big data resources to make sense of it and help the people who plan transportation. So think of it as you know, your local city or department of transportation, um, figure out what's happening on our streets and make better decisions when it comes to figuring out where to add the next lane of traffic or where to reroute traffic when you know, a bridge closes down or what have you. And of course there are numerous problems out there. And to your point, around sort of painting a picture. Um, and I sort of think of it as there's sort of the rational aspect of, of marketing and the and emotional aspect of marketing. How do you communicate the, the vision of what's possible here? And, you know, I think on one hand in this industry, it's easy to get excited about, uh, you know, electric vehicle adoption, you know, flying taxis. And, and we've done a lot of work in that area to help um, not just cities, but people like Uber understand uh, the demand for, um, you know, helicopter transportation, if and when, uh, you know, air taxis happen. And that's great. But the reality is that for the people we're selling to, who are the people planning your transportation day to day, it's things that are much smaller. Um, and yet there are things that impact their communities and things that impact, uh, you know, the political career of their boss and their mayor. And, uh, and ultimately, the information that we provide helps them make improvements to streets um, and make improvements that, you know, get recognition and kudos from their constituents. So, you know, we've all been uh, using ways and other apps to sort of get around traffic and that causes, you know, bottlenecks in, in neighborhoods. Or we've heard about, you know, bicycling being unsafe. All these issues, and there are many, um, you know, need solving. And what we found is that painting a picture around data being an enabler of having a rational conversation with your constituents, with your mayor, with your governor, uh, is, uh, is a really aspirational thing um, for the planners that we deal with. And it's one aspect of sort of painting the emotional benefit of, of you know, using information uh, to make better decisions that ultimately impact communities in a positive way. Okay. So 
So your technology, I mean, you're, you're faced with the challenge that a lot of tech companies are where you're, you're introducing a new technology to the market. Right. Right. Absolutely. And so it's like, it's like building a new category, essentially. Yeah. Building a new category. <clears throat> so you have to do a lot of education on the front end just to let people know that this thing exists right. and here's what it right. is and why you should care. So what are some examples of how you do that? You know, in other words, getting people to see what you see. So I think that, uh, gosh, I mean, this is a, this is a thick topic and, you know, think of this industry as being one that, that relies on data and, a, um, I guess what I'll call analog data that's been historically available and they've, they've relied on it for a long time. So you always hear about federal funding for transportation. Yeah. So one example <clears throat> of, you know, data being used is to help identify how many miles get driven in a given time period and given state to unlock funds. Right. That's a that's a pretty big deal because there are millions of dollars attached to to information. So you're dealing with incumbent data that might be spotty, but is believed by people uh, to be reliable. So the bar for, you know, coming in with a way of, I guess, a digital way of measuring, in this case, traffic, the bar is high because there is this notion of validation and getting people to believe that what you're offering ultimately is um, you know, at least as accurate, if not more, or more comprehensive than what they're used to measuring. So, you know, that bar is high. And I think for us, as it is for many companies trying to disrupt the space uh, with information, um, is just, you know, chipping away um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and proving the efficacy, the accuracy, the reliability, or the validation of whatever it is that you're trying to, to bring to market, you know, one at a time with a lot of attention to detail and, um, and with uh, what I would call kind of honesty and gravitas. I think we, from the very beginning, benefited from having a founder who was very clear about being straightforward about what this data makes possible, what it doesn't. So mm -hmm. one example is, you know, in the early days, we may have been accurate at, you know, measuring uh, uh, how many cars move down a busy road, but maybe that wasn't as good on a country road because there weren't as many signals or what have you, right? And, um, you know, Laura and the team were very straightforward with our customers and people who are testing our product about what's possible, what is it. And I think that's become part of the DNA of the company. And today it's paying back in spades because, you know, from a competitive perspective, um, I think people by and large understand Streetlight as being a player who's, um, you know, who's reliable and um, straightforward and sort of gets past the sort of the black box of, of data. Um, and, uh, and is a, and is a believable, believable provider. So from an educational perspective, I think, you know, one thing is I was kind of chipping away at, <clears throat> at the coalface, but the, the reality is, um, you know, there is a, there's an element of, um, of accuracy and, um, and honesty that comes into this that I think is very important. Okay. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And so. Can you give me an example of how that translates into the uh, kind of content marketing you guys are doing? Like, what are some, you know, content pieces that you guys have produced that communicate that sense of transparency and honesty? Right. Well, I think, you know, on one hand, there's a whole host of, of content marketing stuff that's been out there and it's been used for, you know, decades, right? Which is, you know, case studies and white papers and all sorts of things that sort of help you communicate the validation of data. We found that um, getting customers to talk on our behalf is more important in this industry than any have been uh, today. And, um, you know, it's, it's transportation uh, is an industry that doesn't like to experiment. Um, mm -hmm. It likes to, you know, rely on things that are proven and used by my peers and, and relied on by my peers and getting uh, people to uh, to speak on our behalf has been tremendously powerful, and that could be as simple as getting you know one or two users on a webinar, or getting a handful on a you know on a podcast or a panel, um, and getting them to solve a problem um, that relies on our you know on our analytics. Um, that's been that's been you know incredibly powerful. Um, it's it's a lot more interesting to hear someone else talk about you than to hear. Um, you know, hear your company talk about itself, which I think is, you know, it's always a temptation. Um, so we've used a whole host of, you know, tactics, like I said, sort of spanning kind of live events, recorded events, 
um, you know, various sort of, uh, you know, case study and, and, and digital formats to basically allow the people who've used our product, who've measured streets with our product, um, you know, to talk about how it's changed, um, you know, their ability to, to solve, you know, ever bigger problems and make transportation in their cities better. And, you know, it's not hard to do, um, particularly in places where people are proud of, you know, uh, a new set of bike lanes, right? Or, you know, less congestion in the previously congested space, um, you know, mm -hmm. or a city that's more responsive to, to people wanting to be out there, you know, walking and, and bicycling safety, safely. Um, it's, it's not hard to get people to talk about success there and, uh, and to get their peers to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> um, now I, you, uh, some of your leaders, maybe it's you, have been on other podcasts before, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, it's... so I know that that's part of your uh, marketing strategy as well to guest on other podcasts. So, talk about that a little bit. What value do you get by coming on shows like this one and, and other podcasts? Well, I think you know, there's something. Uh, it, it's in some ways it's analogous to uh, media interviews, but more meaty, right? I think media interviews tend to sort of be kind of they happen on the spot. Um, uh, the questions that are asked are sort of very, in some cases, very obvious questions, but in other cases, sort of different ways to get at the, get at the topic. Um, and I always find podcasts to be a, a place that sort of, you know, kind of takes down the bar, uh, allows you to have a free conversation and, and very often surfaces, you know, new ways of looking at a problem and, and, um, and new ways of seeing how the marketplace is, is looking at your problems. So I think besides being, you know, a fun kind of interactive, interpersonal way of getting in front of an audience. Um, I think the topics that end up getting discussed are less scripted uh, and very often more interesting than they are, you know, in, in something um, like a webinar that is, you know, that is uh, uh, nicely planned and, and scripted. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking to get, say, your CEO or other leaders of the company on a podcast, what kind of podcast are you looking for? <laughs> well, I think we're looking at, and, and you're, you know, you're the expert here, right? I think we're looking at folks um, who like to be a little controversial, folks who like to sort of ask, um, you know, interesting questions uh, and not being afraid to look at an industry from a, you know, from a cross industry or a different sort of angle. Um, so I think that's what we tend to look at. I, I think we also, you know, there are certain topics that we like to talk about, such as, um, you know, new mobility um, you know, bicycling, uh, mm -hmm. privacy, uh, in the analytics space. Um, so I think we also look at sort of podcasts, uh, from a topical perspective and try to identify folks who, um, you know, like to talk on a, on a particular topic. And for us, you know, there's a whole range of things. It's like, you know, road mm -hmm. safety is a really big deal in our industry. Um, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of news recently mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, traffic death spiking and, and driving mm -hmm. people dangerous post pandemic. And that's a, that's a big topic. Um, and it's just one example of a, of a venue and, and a set of, um, you know, podcasts and, and, uh, and folks that we'd like to, to engage with. Very good. So <clears throat> what's your advice for marketing teams that are in a similar position? They have a new category and they need to educate their audience about it. What's your main takeaway? I think my main takeaway is particularly in, in SaaS, um, you know, there's a tendency for products to uh, come out of the R&D lab or, you know, uh, or the development lab. Um, you know, there are a lot of you know, founders in the Valley who are, you know, convinced about their ideas and find success initially and, you know, hire a growth marketer um, and, um, and attempt to sell their product to anybody that'll buy it. And it's great. It works for a little while. And in some ways, this sort of dates back to sort of the, the early 2000s period of, of Silicon Valley marketing um, that sort of found a different path around what I would say is 2007, 2010, um, kind of bringing in some of the CPG marketing acumen into, into the Valley and really thinking fundamentally about who these companies are serving, uh, you know, what are the needs of those, of those users um, you know, and how can I communicate my value proposition? And it goes right back to sort of the Kool-Aid, um, you know, that you drink if you, if you do marketing at Procter & Gamble or, 
or Gillette or any of these brands that, um, that sort of created marketing. But I think it really goes back to um, working hard to understand who your user is. And I sort of, I, you know, I dropped uh, Procter & Gamble because I began my marketing career there. You know, whether you were selling coffee or detergent or something else at Procter & Gamble, you knew exactly who your prime prospect was, you know, you know what she drove and uh, uh, where she shopped and, and you know all about her family. And, um, and that was critical to sort of diving deeper to understand, you know, what her needs were uh, when it came to the stuff that she ultimately bought. And, um, and I think the same applies in, you know, in SaaS and, and technology. And for us, you know, I sort of talked about this insight that city planners, um, you know, care about good outcomes, but they also care about, you know, obviously what their constituents think. And, you know, that's an insight that is sort of below the surface, but requires some work to, to get up. Um, and it takes a lot of sort of the, the bare bones, you know, persona work and, and consumer insight work to get there. So it's, it's a lot of that boring stuff that's really fundamental um, that I think is actually quite critical, particularly when building a new category, when you're relying on new adopters or early adopters, um, you know, to, to buy your product and, and live by it and swear by it sufficiently enough to go out there and, advocate on your behalf okay really good good stuff there um lots to lots to think about so well martin thank you for all that and uh for some really great insights what what you guys are doing just sounds really really interesting and really breaking new ground so uh it'll be interesting to follow to to follow you guys and see how everything develops and meanwhile just thanks for making time to be on the show i really appreciate it no, no problem at all. Nice to spend the morning with you and uh, look forward to, to running into you and folks listening on in the city near you where we're all over the country now. <laughs>